well, Kavita, uh, thanks very much for um, being at our meeting tonight. Um, we are we're watching on from afar this very fantastic looking movement for gender justice um, that's taking place and seems to be not just through India but spreading through South Asia as well. Um, you know, so can you please tell us, uh, you know, what has sparked this? Um, I think it's a cumulative effect of a series of uh, uh, never-ending series of instances of sexual violence uh, all over the country, uh, but also in India's capital city, Delhi. And uh, I think that along with the incidents, it's also an accumulated anger at the response of the authorities. Almost inevitably, the government and the police have looked for a way to blame the uh, people at the receiving end, women in particular. They have tried to blame everything except look uh, at whether, uh, you know, uh, except to ex you know look at their own accountability. So I think there was a tremendous anger at that. And this particular incident, this young woman and her friend, they were both, uh, you know, uh, not well off. They were struggling to uh, study and survive in Delhi and uh, where uh, she was preparing for a course which would have made her a paramedic, which is part of, uh, you know, this huge new emerging working class in Delhi, uh, where young people are doing uh, courses, professional courses of one or the other kind, and then getting absorbed in the labor force, but of an extremely insecure labor force with no secure jobs, be exploited. So I think they uh, this huge number of young people in Delhi now in these kind of situations, they, uh, her, her plight, her, her situation struck a chord with them. The right to just watch a film and go home on a public bus, that this basic right should be fraught with such danger uh, in the capital city of India. I think that was the, you know, sort of the catalyst. And as for the people participating, as I said, these are young people, these are young students, young professionals, people working in a variety of small and big um, companies and institutions, and uh, a lot of young women as well as young men. So for us in the women's movement in India, it's 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 very heartening to see the spontaneous participation of a very large number of young men as well as young women who are speaking their mind on the streets, who are using placards to uh, to uh, show their anger against uh, you know the victim blaming. Uh, they have placards saying, uh, "Don't teach us how to dress. Teach your sons not to rape." They have placards saying, "My voice is higher than my miniskirt." Uh, there was another saying, uh, ignore my lipstick and listen to what I'm saying. There was another placard, you know, there, there, there are so many of them. These are handmade placards. Uh, one of them saying, uh, you know, you raped her because uh, her clothes provoked you. Uh, let me break your face because you were... I the session on the street was very exciting because there were young men also with placards, handmade placards. And I saw one in which they had, uh, one young person had written, a young man had written, when we men were... Uh, muscle shirts, you know, shirts that show our muscles, uh, women don't rape us. So obviously he was thinking about this whole easy equation of dress as being provocative of sexual violence, and uh, he had thought about it. So I think it's a, it's a very exciting time in India, and this, uh, the widening of the scope of the concerns, which till yesterday had been seen as the concerns of women alone, of women's issues boxed off from fundamental questions of democracy and uh, equality. I think they have been kind of dragged center stage and uh, the political, uh, mainstream political parties are floundering to respond. Almost every day there is uh, some major politician uh, from India's ruling elite uh, who makes a statement either blaming the victim or uh, branding protesters as a mob. Today we have one central minister saying that India is becoming a mobocracy and the political, elected political leaders are not obliged to come and talk to every crowd uh, that uh, demands to speak to them. So I think that this is uh, reflective of this arrogance. I can't tell you the long list of uh, political leaders who have made uh, rape culture remarks of a variety of uh, kinds. And uh, this, uh, it's all adding up to the anger and the... Uh, the impetus for change. Uh, today's papers tell us that the Supreme Court uh, yesterday, uh, you know, admitted a petition by some uh, 
young women lost students uh, against the two finger test and they have asked the government's position on this test and the petition has asked for a complete ban so we also have been circulating a uh, we have also have been collecting signatures for a uh, for a petition on this the same issue so it's good that india supreme court is also uh, taking it uh, seriously it seems so it's, it's something to move upon now the demands we are raising are uh, see this the movement is a very large one it was spontaneous and to begin with uh, in a sense the demands were um, you know quite uh, it took time to take shape and i think that's fine but i think that uh, there are two strands there is one strand and uh, 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 the increasingly you know there is there is a shrill section that is trying to narrow the entire debate to demanding death penalty for rape chemical castration for rape something which uh, many of us uh, in the movement have been uh, have have not felt at all comfortable with the entire question being uh, narrowed to one of quantum of punishment severity of punishment rather we are concerned about uh, ensuring swiftness and sureness of punishment because india has uh, conviction rates for rape and sexual violence and other forms of violence against women are abysmally low so we think we have to look at structural reasons for why it is low and why uh, such crimes are not taken seriously and then you have to address and you also you have to address a whole range of things including the built in misogyny in your laws the built in misogyny in the response of your police and investigative mechanisms your medical uh, medical legal systems and then your judiciary as well and of course your political class so you i think you need to look at the whole uh, the whole matrix of uh, patriarchal discrimination misogyny and violence and then address it as a whole so some of the demands we have focused on as being non negotiables you know demands we have to focus on and, uh, and achieve now these have included one has been that uh, there should be uh, a move to ensure justice in the more than 1 lakh that's 100000 pending uh, sexual assault cases in the country which have some of them have been dragging on for years some more than a decade so we have been uh, saying that you know there should be some move to ensure more ju- more judges more courts and faster trials and especially in all these pending cases there should be some kind of time bound move towards justice and uh, the other thing we have asked for uh, is a protocol to ensure uh you know for the pol- to uh, to to map out what the police response must be to cases of violence against women uh we want uh we want the police to say very clearly they have in their police stations this list of exactly what they're going to do when a woman approaches them for for for, for action what, where, how are they going to fi- how soon are they going to file the complaint what is the method of investigation what are the questions they will ask what are the questions they will not ask and all of this and there has to be some method of penalty for police uh, personnel who violate this protocol but as of now there has been no move towards such protocol there have been some very cosmetic uh, you know things like helplines for women and all which we have tried even in the past few days and these have been a dismal failure the other thing we are asking is that there have to be gender just laws the laws have to uh, have a major overhaul to actually recognize the forms of violence that women face which include uh which include uh, custodial rape by police or the army which include marital rape which india's uh, rape law uh, names specifically as an exemption it exempts sexual contact between husband and wife uh, from being brought into the category of rape so in a way it's saying that if a woman if a woman marries she has signed away the right to autonomy over her sexuality over her body so this is completely unacceptable for us we want this to change then we want uh, the indian uh, uh, sexual uh, violence laws define uh, molestation as the outraging of modesty now this is uh, something that is a carry over from the colonial day the way it is defined and um, uh you know we want this out we don't want uh, sexual violence to be framed in the vocabulary of modesty or uh, women's uh, respectability and we say this also because you know even now as the trial proceeds the defense lawyer for the uh, for the accused he has spoken to the media and said no respected lady in india gets raped 
so there's this whole attempt not just of course i'm saying he is you know uh, he is drawing upon an entire spectrum of political and social uh, powerful political and social voices which are saying exactly the same thing which are saying westernization uh, is leading to rape india was perfectly well off before you know we began to ape the western mores and western clothes and specifically women's westernization women seeking uh, independence and equality and access to public spaces is itself seen uh, by these uh, orthodox voices feudal and patriarchal voices as some kind of uh, westernization and uh, they caricature that in terms of certain forms of clothing or uh, relationships and lifestyle and they say that well if all this is going to be there rape is natural rape is bound to be there so uh, i think that this defense lawyer is basically drawing upon all of that and uh, that shows you uh, that uh, this whole that your rape trials and your rape laws if they are going to be framed in the language of modesty if you are going to allow uh, a, a women's being habituated to sex uh to be used to be checked as part of a rape exam uh, rape medical examination and then be used against her in court to say she must have consented because she is uh habituated to sex or if consent in a rape trial is uh defined you know in order to prove consent if you have to show physical injury to uh, uh you know to, to the woman's body these are uh, very very problematic you're medicalizing consent and we are trying to challenge the range of this and uh, there is a uh, committee uh, headed by a former chief justice of the india supreme court a uh, former justice of the india supreme court and uh, well we have given our recommendations various women's groups have various parties have but uh, we really don't know what uh, they're going to come up with because they are not there is no move uh, to do what we ask them to do which is to speak specifically to people in the women's movement you know you have women lawyers who have worked for decades who have decades of experience in in uh, in, in uh, talking about discussing analyzing the laws related to women who have worked with thousands of affected women these are the people that the uh, the committee and the government ought to be talking to before they frame the laws but they have not been doing that they have uh, just invited invitations from people across the board so we are not uh, sure whether they will be listening to us at all uh, this was a spontaneous movement where we found a whole lot of young people self organizing they were organizing where they study they were organizing where they work and uh, they were organizing in small and big groups where they live and uh, a lot of them have reached out to us uh, especially those who have uh, a very large number of those who have been wanting to uh, take the discussion beyond uh, just uh, cries for a particular form of severe punishment they have been trying to deepen the issue of how we look at sexual violence in this in our society and how that needs to change how we as a society need to change the way we look at this and how the entire range of institutions that uh that are bolstering up patriarchy how those institutions need to need to be changed need need to be challenged you know sort of lock stock and barrel so i think that uh, uh this is that there is a very large number of people beyond uh our organizations alone beyond left organizations who have resonated you know who have come closer to us or who are working with us because they feel that uh what we have offered to them in terms of analysis or in terms of articulation has been very close to what they themselves have been feeling and this i think is very significant because in the women's movement in india uh you know we have always been told ever since uh, i mean i was uh, a student and i would uh, talk about such issues i have been told i told by countless people oh you know the women's movement and these feminists you you people are just talking about a certain very thin layer of urbanized women uh our indian women don't need or want all this you know these ideas will never be acceptable in society the ideas of women wanting to be free will never be acceptable in society and today to find that our slogans of freedom are uh, are being embraced by people with such enthusiasm such sort of young people such a lot of people in so many parts of not just delhi but uh, even other parts of the country is something which is uh, very encouraging so i 
we have activists of the uh, Delhi University, which is the largest university in uh, in Delhi, with a very large number of undergraduate colleges attached to it. So several of the young men and women involved in that, you know, uh, such as uh, there's this young uh, activist of ours called Sunny. Then there is a young uh, girl who contested for president's students union election last year, Nikita. They have been very active in reaching out to a very large number of students. So we've had very successful meetings in uh, the universities and outside, and not just in the universities, but other places too. And uh, beyond this, there have been young girls who, who spoke to me, who, re who contacted me out of the blue, who had held protests uh, you know, in Delhi spontaneously. There's one case in which 16 girls who happened to meet at uh, India's Parliament Street, they didn't want to join a right-wing uh, Hindu organization in the protest. So they met each other, befriended each other, and held a small demonstration there. Uh, you know, they marched towards the police barricades. They were taken into the police station and quite badly, you know, roughed up. You know, the hair was pulled and they were slapped around and all of that. And uh, when they went home they got threatening calls from the police station saying you know you have tweeted you have told the media and so you uh, we will you either apologize or we will come and uh, you know uh, arrest you now so these girls uh, you know had reached out for help but had also reached out because they had heard what we were saying they liked it and they said you know we want to we uh, we want to be doing uh, the kind of work that you people are doing so yesterday they uh, organized for, for perhaps for the first time in their life they mobilized very hard for the past few days and they organized a very successful meeting in their uh, social work department of delhi university so there are people of all kinds doing this kind of work all over delhi you know, the slogan in this movement when it spontaneously erupted was, we want justice. So across the board, everyone was saying, we want justice. And uh, of course, very naturally, there was anger. And uh, so justice would tend to get defined only in terms of hanging for the rapists or capital punishment for the rapists and so on and so forth. So I, I, I tend to see that as basically an expression of anger and an intimate expression of anger. But we also felt the need to you know, those of us from the, the left movement, the revolutionary left movement, they, we wanted to, uh, it, it, to to thicken that uh, question of justice and put in some more, uh, you know, try and define what we meant by justice, which is why we raised the slogan, so we want freedom. And I think that uh, young women and men picked up that slogan like anything. And it went to everything from the freedom to uh, freedom from, you know, all kinds of moral tarts, freedom from freedom to study, the freedom to be born, the freedom to choose who you will marry, uh, regardless of your caste and so on, and uh, freedom from community and caste uh, in outfits which uh, tell you to do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that, but also the freedom to protest, the freedom to be a citizen of a democratic country and express our voices on the street. Uh, without having to be tear gassed or beaten up by the police. So I think that all these have, uh, uh, you know, this was the, the slogan of freedom was what we contributed to this movement. And that's very important. And in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, so many people who are supporting, I genuinely, I, I think what you said is very right, which is that while India has its specific problems, you know, Indian women have the workers in a way because there's this huge, very tenacious, feudal kind of mindset and background and uh, feudal structures which are uh, still still very powerful and they are not they are still you know kind of uh, coexisting with and they're bolstered up by, uh, by uh, new liberal reforms and new liberal policies so i think that uh, india has the specificity where women have the worst of both worlds you know but also uh, in terms of capitalist exploitation and uh, you know, market-driven kind of uh, pressures and cult cultural pressures, but also the traditional orthodoxies, which are very strong, very tenacious. But I think that in a way, there's also a lot which is common, because I think there's an entire resurgence of rape culture all over the world. You know, I, we, we saw it in the, what the Republican Party leaders said in the U.S. We saw similar things in the debate over what happened after the sexual assault case in Australia. And I, I feel the need to stress here that if the movement in India has attracted so much attention, you know, we need to underline that uh, it should not be seen as some kind of very narrow uh, movement driven just by class interests. I know this has been said 
and this is an influential idea in some parts of uh, you know in among some people but i think that we on the left should look at this differently because this is a moment of awakening these are people who did not protest on a variety of sexual assaults that happened with women from other from working class uh, backgrounds and so on but i think that this is a, they didn't protest even when other kinds of rapes happened in delhi even with uh, women from relatively privileged backgrounds so i think that this is something this is a new awakening and uh, well a uh, uh, young and people in rural india as well as people in cities like delhi and cities across the country uh, if they have come to this movement a very large number of them have found their patriarchal certainties shaken up i've seen this with a whole lot of young men who participated in the struggles who came to discuss how they were feeling disturbed by the slogan of freedom but they didn't say we won't come with you because you're raising those slogans they came forward to talk to say are you sure that's all right freedom to do so many things won't that put our sisters at greater risk so what we told them was that if you're feeling disturbed by this did you feel disturbed yesterday or were those certainties still yesterday how women and men are different and have different rules and different standards for both sexes if today you are questioning any of that if uh, somewhere you are uh, shaken up in your certainties i think that uh, feeling of uh, feeling uh, disturbed should be embraced should be welcomed and we should be you know all all of us should question all the you know patriarchal certainties which are which so many of us also subscribe to at so many levels or or try to rationalize in terms of in india you know there's a tendency to rationalize it by saying oh westernized clothing the left also should be against it because this is objectification or commodification i think we need to say there that no the market pressurizes you to dress in a particular way uh, but so does so many forms of uh, your traditional society uh, uh, in india as well so women make their choices given uh, you know in, in resisting the pressures so many so many different kinds of pressures so it's not that we recognize one kind of pressure to conform and we don't recognize others so i think uh, we all need to think about these issues and uh, we are having very exciting time here in india uh, talking to so many people about these issues and taking the movement forward